Good morning, colleagues. Thank you for tuning out every single Monday and having patience. Our very first speaker today is um, Honorable Kenson Kazimi, Minister for Youth Development and Sports, and also MP for Grosely. Thank you very much. Morning, everybody. Um, of course, another successful weekend for St. Lucia in sport. St. Lucia back-to-back -back champions at the Caribbean Boxing Championship held from, well, held on the weekend at the VG Sports Complex. Um, by the same token, St. Lucia just edged out by Grenada in under-19 cricket and not so good results in the netball, the Caribbean Netball Championship. But um, sports continues to be a shining light for St. Lucia, uh, especially over the last two and a half years. And we're certainly hoping to continue to provide as much support as possible to our athletes and uh, to motivate them to do their very best. Um, in terms of youth, we've continued to have conversation, have conversation about our youth policy, which will be on Cabinet's desk next week. And of course, we would also be bringing together to Cabinet a sports policy that has not been in existence in St. Lucia. Um, so I'm very excited about those two developments. And uh, later on this month, we will be seeing youth parliament and youth activities continue throughout the land and breadth of this country. Questions? Um, on the youth policy, mm -hmm. um, I heard some, some rumblings by youth activists <laughs> saying that they were not um, consulted for the creation of this policy. Uh, could you explain w really the process by which the policy was developed. Yeah. The policy was developed by youth practitioners. Um, we had uh, the late Mr. Charles um, beat, do all the consultations with uh, the youth practitioners throughout St. Lucia, including the NYC and the constituency groups, the district youth and sports councils. What happened was that when we came into government, we had some challenges with the printing of the policies and we had some we identified some errors, some typo, typographic errors, some errors in the language that we had to hold back on. Um, we did engage young people again to inform them of those, uh, those discrepancies, lapses and infelicities within the documents. And so by the time we had done all our due diligence, um, the time frame for which the document was supposed to be identified elapsed. And so we went back to the drawing board again. Uh, unfortunately, Mr. Charles passed away and we engaged his wife to continue uh, to really develop the document in a proper way. Um, the ministry definitely consulted and will consult again the Youth and Sports Councils, the NYC, with the actual information within the document that they will see um, is no big different, difference from what was originally in there and uh, we are going to then present it to Cabinet and move forward. Yes, um, yes. We just recently had the, um, the regional OECS, Regional Sports uh, Youth Sports Council, yeah. and Dr. Jules spoke about you know, the, the input of youth in this development because you see some of these formulas have been outdated. Mm -hmm. Would this be like a, a precursor in terms of you know, moving forward would, would the wider OECS um, General Council be involved in this um, implementation of the youth policy? Absolutely. If you look at the OECS territories, the challenges faced by young people are not dissimilar. It's not that dissimilar. It's in incumbent upon the nation to actually identify what the dis dissimilarities are, what sets them apart from the other territories, and pretty much set a policy that, that is pretty much guarded towards that nation's development. I don't think it makes much sense to reinvent the wheel necessarily to start from scratch. For instance, sports policy. Grenada has a very good sports policy. Grenada in terms of its population, in terms of its economy, in terms of its uh, people, uh, athletes, are not that dissimilar from St. Lucia. So what we are going to do is we are going to uh, take a look at their sports policy, obviously engage the stakeholders from St. Lucia in terms of the Olympic Committee, the sports associations, the administrators, the PE teachers, um, and then tweak 
what is in there to set it apart and make it into St. Lucia's sports policy. And this is what the OECS youth and sports ministers have agreed on, working collaboratively to ensure that we are more efficient and effective with what we are doing uh, instead of operating in silos. And so this is where we are going and this is the expectation for us as we move forward. And, you know, moving forward, you know, a lot of emphasis on youth development, sports development. Now we know of um, physical education is part of PE, is part of school, the school. Mm -hmm. But in terms of sports development, would you see somewhere down the line that this being a criteria in, in, in the school curriculum? Because, I mean, you know, now there's prospects for professionals, for administrators, for, you know, technical. Absolutely. It's a symbiotic sort of relationship with the PE Teachers Association, it's supposed to be established that way with the Ministry of Youth and Sport. If you look at the glory days of sports development in St. Lucia, anybody would tell you it was when the Ministry of Youth Development and Sports fell under or was in tandem with the Ministry of Education under Mary Michelle. Um, since we've had that sort of separation, it's been challenging in terms of getting these two ministries to function together. But we saw that with Island Champs moving on the weekend, we were able to come together and execute that in the interest of sports development, youth and sports development in St. Lucia. And we also expect that as we move forward with all other developments, because sports development is a pyramid. You have the inclusion of all individuals at the bottom of the period, the pyramid until you get to the top which are the elite athletes. And so the schools would give you the bottom of the pyramid where you can start identifying the talent and putting them in the different programs to ensure you reach at the top of the hierarchy. And so this is what we are doing. Um, if you look at, for instance, in cricket development, we have a grassroots cricket program that is in tandem with most schools. And then you have, from there, you have an under 15 national team. And these individuals then, they, they graduate to an under 19 team and then a senior team. And at the top of that pyramid, we have a high performance center where we've brought together about 30 of the best cricketers in St. Lucia in a program of health, nutrition, um, physical fitness, and of course, the mental capabilities of these individuals. So it's a very strategic way we are developing sport in St. Lucia, and we're certainly hoping to reap those benefits within the next 10 to 20 years. Okay, on the topic of youth development, right now, the National Youth Council, in collaboration with the Caribbean Youth Council is hosting their sustainable advocacy and policy training um, in Bay Gardens. Your general comments on this, and is there any plans for them to be incorporated in the upcoming policy development as well? I didn't hear the last part. You went all the way down. Sorry. Any plans for them to be included in the upcoming policy development, as you would have mentioned earlier? Well, <laughs> it's, it's, it's funny that there is a thought that um, they are not involved anyway. I just, I just think it's, it's funny that, that that is being pushed out there. The National Youth um, Council, similar to the government of St. Lucia, it carries on. So I don't think necessarily because you have a new executive that you necessarily have to go back to square one. I, don't, I just don't think that is productive. It's incumbent upon the government that is coming in or the leadership of the NYC that is coming in to familiarize yourself with what the youth policy is, what the conversations have been as it pertains to youth policy development, and they are always free, always free to engage the ministry, the director of youth, and everybody that form part of the ministry on what their thoughts are and make their contribution. So we're not, we are not a, a ministry that has sidelined anybody. And uh, I think at the end of the day, we need to understand that this, the government is not just the minister, the government is all of us. And so working with the government will allow for us to have more productivity instead of every single executive that comes in believes that we need to go back to square one. And on sports, um, over the weekend, St. Lucia secured its second title, again, um, champions for champion of the Champions Boxing Tournament. Just your comment on that itself. Thanks for correcting me. Yes, it's champions of champions, Caribbean Boxing um, Tournament. Um, I think the shining light has to be on what's happening in Viewfort, the Viewfort gym. I know the Castries gym gets a little jealous when I say that, but we know what has been happening in terms of the social development of young people in the community of Viewfort. And we are seeing that this boxing sort of fraternity in Viewfort really coming together and doing so much work that is very impressive. John Didier, again, from the community of Labry, attended Viewfort Comprehensive, gold medalist. And we had a nine-year-old from the community of Viewfort also win a gold medal. And so it means that the research is being done. 
in identifying those young persons that have the ability to box. And boxing is a sport that you need a lot of discipline, you need a lot of self-control. You need to be able to time what happens in the ring. And so these are the life lessons that are being taught in Viewfort right now. And the fact that we have gold medals on the Caribbean region, on a Caribbean level coming from Viewfort, um, tells us that we have cause to celebrate in this nation. Jimmy's over the weekend as well, Rajan wanted to have mentioned um, Grocery Vendors Association did take home the guineas for, I'm guessing, the category. So we'll toss your comments on that as well. I'm very proud of the Grocery Vendors Association. As, as I've always said, the Grocery Vendors Association is an association that functions um, in the interest of not just their members, but they, they have an important role of being the face of Grocery to tourists who come on a Friday night. And they take that very, very seriously. And of course, as MP, even before I was MP, you would have noted that we had, during COVID, fundraising events to ensure that they were happy, that they were back on their feet, because we understood that the vendors really opened the door to who grossly people are. And so if they represent you properly, you can get more and more economic activities being held in your community. There's not a single tourist who comes to St. Lucia who does not feel the need to go to Grosley Friday night, especially when they're there on the weekend. And so we continue to encourage these vendors to keep a smile on their face. As the MP, I always try my best to um, provide whatever support that I can to them. And we certainly uh, congratulate them on this achievement. And we know there'll be many, many more to come. Yes? Apologies, good morning. Hi. At the last briefing, you described the rehabilitation for the uh, George Odom Stadium as ambitious, but you did not quite outline how your ministry falls into that plan. Mm -hmm. If you said it's technical oversight or, or some alignment, can you just give us some more detail as to how your ministry is working alongside on that project? Okay, so the technical aspect of developing any grounds, any sporting facility uh, would fall under the ambit of the Ministry of Youth Development and Sports. So in terms of the design, in terms of the 400 meter track itself, there are specifications that are put um, by the Olympic Committee, the International Olympic Committee, that must be followed. Uh, positioning of the long jump pit, triple jump pit, um, the safety protocols that must be put in place to ensure that uh, fans are safe, athletes are safe, all those things would fall under the Ministry of Youth Development and Sport. And so it would be incumbent upon the Ministry to, to pretty much look at the designs and provide the technical advice for how those designs are supposed to be implemented to ensure that we get to a point of having international approval. So that is my main responsibility, similar with the Darren Sami Cricket Grounds. Whereas we may not be the financiers of everything that happened, we certainly have a technical aspect too developing the facility that is very critical. We saw in the, uh, uh, the estimates, mm -hmm. some of $2.5 million allocated towards that. Mm -hmm. But the consultancy uh, uh, allocation of $2 million out of that amount. Can you explain to us further how the consultancy fees would be more than the allocation for the works? That is a question for the Minister of Finance uh, to address, and so that is that does not fall within my purview at this current moment. So you as Minister, you have no knowledge, no oversight, no involvement? That is for the Minister of Finance uh, and his team at the Ministry of Finance to allocate and to provide that sort of leadership on this project. But does your ministry have any say in the consultancy in terms of uh, having any involvement in the uh, candidates that are The Ministry of secured? Youth Development and Sports will continue to be the technical aspect of anything to do with a facility development. We have a director who is responsible to ensure that what the international standards are are being implemented at any venue in St. Lucia. And so for me as minister, my sole role, one of my main roles, is to ensure that whatever development is being implemented at the George Adams Stadium, it will ensure that we as a nation 
can meet the standards that are put together by the International Olympic Committee. That's my responsibility. So in terms of the costing of works at the Darren Sammy Stadium, mm -hmm. the Grosley Playing Field, which I know is very close to you, mm -hmm. and the Minnefoda Park, do we have an overall estimate of what those works cost? We, we do have an estimate of what the works cost. Um, we do have, as let me just explain this because I've heard this before. We had a unique situation in the region where the U.S. was being engaged by the International Cricket Council to host cricket. And I think most of us here know that the U.S. is not necessarily a global cricket nation. There were many discussions about who in the region were going to be the countries selected to host Cricket World Cup. Jamaica was in the mix, Antigua was in the mix, Dominica was in the mix. Despite the fact that St. Lucia put in their bid early, we were not informed about whether or not St. Lucia was going to host Cricket World Cup until very late in the game. When the decision came and St. Lucia was selected to host Cricket World Cup, we as a government felt that it was absolutely necessary to do all within our powers to ensure that we indeed host the World Cup and we indeed develop our facilities to ensure proper hosting of World Cup. And so, despite the fact that everything came in late, we had to ensure that we could design and construct and make adjustments to the facilities to meet again the standards of the IOC and so the ICC. And so it was very difficult for us to have gone to square one. We'd have to design and make adjustments. So this is why you would not hear me say that it took $25 million for us to do all those renovations. It's because while, because of the time sensitivity of everything that we're doing, we have to ensure that the work continues. And so if you take a look at the Darren Sammy Cricket Grounds, you'll be more than satisfied that we have done a very good job and that we continue to ensure that we are fiscally prudent as we continue to strive towards being the best venue for this competition this year. So do we know the contractors on the projects? Okay, so the and, contractors... And the selection process, can you explain that to us? Okay, so the selection process is, is very similar to what would happen when you have any venue that you need done expeditedly. We engage as many contractors as possible to provide costing for, for works based on the designs. Um, it goes to the NLA, National Lodges Authority, and then they would sit and opine on this with the aid of the actual overseer of the entire project. A contractor has been identified. That contractor actually went through the same rigorous process of uh, providing a resume, providing a list of works accomplished, and going through the entire process of selection, and then those contracts are awarded. And so we have multiple, multiple, multiple contracts being awarded. And so we have uh, the local organizing committee who on a Wednesday and a Sunday, they come together and they set their targets and they ensure from monitoring, monitoring and evaluation that those targets are being met. And so, so far we've had no issues Everything is happening very much above board, and we continue to push towards hosting this cricket event in June. Yeah, who are the contractors? That's what I just said. We have multiple. I do not have the list before me, but we have multiple contractors. We have contracts for, for instance, we have optimum cooling for the air conditioning. For instance, you would have a flow or another individual for the internet upgrades. For instance, for the media center, you would have one contractor identified to ensure that the media center is up to the standard requested by the IOC. And all of those subcontracts, so to speak, would be tendered for. But you have an overall executing company? Yes, we do. What's the, who's the overall company? We, I do not have that information right now. Um, I do know the individual. I don't remember his company's name, but I don't think it's necessary for me to, at this moment, put just the individual name out. I would prefer to give the company, but I don't have the company's name right now. But it's a registered company? Absolutely. And the individual is a director, owner, CEO? 
it's a registered company, you can't give the name. I don't want to give the name right now. So the name of the individual and the company are two separate things? Yes. That's difficult to understand. I don't think so. If I have a company, St. Lucia Sports Align, I'm Kenson Kazmir, and there's St. Lucia Sports Align as my company. But you identify with the company. You are you. Decisions being made mm -hmm. would be made by you. Not necessarily. Not but necessarily. in keeping with you. Not necessarily. You could have a company and not necessarily you be the one making all the decisions. Let me just give you an example. In media, I was very good at writing sports, right? But the actual design of my page, the actual picture that would come out, that would be done by somebody else. And I'd give that person autonomy to really decide on how this thing is being done. So, but executive decisions would be made by you. But I do understand. Executive decisions are made by a team. I, I, I understand by your team. response, Minister. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Thank you. Any questions on I youth development? Just, from, from I think the, the other journalists have covered. I do have one other question mm -hmm. pertaining to the constituency. Uh, the heliport, you, last time you said you had not really followed. Uh, That's not what the, I said. Or you will not at the meeting? Have you been briefed on, on what's taking place? No. Pertaining to that? No. Why is that? Okay, sir, can we have another question? Thank you, Madam Press Secretary. That's my final question to the minister. Mm -hmm. No, I have not been briefed. And why is that? Well, apparently That's the person... I can actually answer that question. The person who is supposed to be responsible for engaging and briefing the parliamentary rep has not seen it fit to do so. But we all know That's your constituency is very close and dear to you. Oh, very dear have to you, me. Have you not made the effort to contact the relevant in individual authorities to understand exactly what's happening? Yes, I have. But let's put it this way. As a parliamentary rep, I always want to be informed and I think it's respectable to inform me of meetings or developments that are ongoing or proposed for my community before we have any engagement with the wider community. That was not done. And you've communicated your displeasure I have. to the relevant authorities I have. and individuals? I have. Okay. Thank you very much, Minister. Have you gotten any complaints from your constituents about the prospect? Yeah. Absolutely. They are afraid of the noise and the discomfort of having helicopters fly right next to their house at odd times during the day. You said the relevant authority had not informed you. Um, is that the Department of Aviation, Civil, the Civil Aviation? They would be part of it. Okay. And DCA? I've had some conversations with DCA. Yeah, any more questions, people? Okay. <clears throat> um, I just want to make a, a short statement on the unfounded and baseless and misinformed statements of the leader of the opposition as it, ref as it pertains to the, my visit to Brussels and the Nusha's CIP program. The leader of the opposition has quite recently tried to deny great, trying to cause the Senusian people undue harm by spreading malicious and false propaganda about Senusia, about its financial management, and about its investment profile. Recent, recently, he wrote the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank with complete falsity. The National Lottery Association actually owns the Darren Sami Ground. It owns it and all the surrounding lands around the Darren Sami Stadium. The National Lottery has just completed payment of the Darren Sami Grounds. It's a complete government asset. When the leader of the, of the opposition says that the National, National Lottery Association has no assets, it's absolutely untrue. 
absolutely untrue. There's no truth in, in, in that. The National Lottery Association, it receives its fees from the games that are used, that are played in St. Lucia. That's where the fees come from. In July 2021, just before the elections, that leader of the opposition was in the cabinet and he signed a document giving concessions to the provider so that fees could be paid to the NLA. That, that was his work. So these <clears throat> statements are completely false, absolutely false. The leader of the opposition believes that the old saying, he can burn the house to kill a rat. The fact that he's not in, po in power, he's not in government, that the people of St. Lucia has, have rejected him, have rejected his party by 15 seats to two, he begins and spreads these falsities, these falsities and that rumor mongering, which has no basis in fact. Speculation, misinformation, and innuendo. No basis in fact. <clears throat> Last week, I represented the people of Zelusia in Brussels at several important bilateral meetings with the European Union. <clears throat> I met with Mr. Johannes Loster, who is the Deputy Director General for Migration and Home Affairs in the European Commission, and Mr. Dimitrios Gitokas, who is Head of Visa Policy, regarding their proposed changes to visa-free travel for the Sengen Zone, and how these potential changes would impact countries with investor citizens programs like St. Lucia. Incidentally, the visa-free access was negotiated by the St. Lucia Labour Party government. I want to repeat it. The visa-free access for the Sengen Zone was negotiated by the Labour Party government, and I was the government at this time. I also met with members of the European Parliament from the Netherlands and <clears throat> I was not summoned to Europe. Europe has no problems with us. I was not summoned to, to Europe. Saying that I was summoned to Europe is ridiculous. I was never summoned to Europe. I traveled to Europe to meet with the EU lawmakers, and that was planned over a month ago. I wanted to speak to the EU face to face and explain to them the rigorous due diligence undertaken by our CIP investment program. And I also wanted to speak to the EU before my government signs St. Lucia to any memorandum of agreement on citizenship by investment with our Caribbean neighbors. <clears throat> Let me emphasize that St. Lucia was part of the, the discussions all the time. There is no agreement in the European Union. This is, again, a falsity on the leader of the opposition. What is, there is a memorandum of agreement between the countries involved in the CIP program, not an agreement with the EU or with anybody else. The only agreement that we have is with the American government. It's not, and what the American government gave us is six points that we should follow. And St. Lucia has followed all these points. So the matter of an agreement with the EU government is a falsity. This is a memorandum of agreement among the countries in the region who have CIP programs. Not with the European government. This is not true. And I want to tell you that I participated in all discussions. St. Lucia was an active participant in the discussions among... There is no conflict between St. Lucia and the OECS government. St. Lucia participated in all these discussions. In fact, St. Lucia is already following all 
what's in that MOE. All what St. Lucia said is that we need to complete the contractual agreements that we have with investors before we sign on to any price changes. Incidentally, these price changes were done by the leader of the opposition, when he was Minister of Finance. They were done by him. He was the one who initiated these price changes, the leader of the opposition. He's the one who removed the fact that anyone who wanted to, to get involved in our citizenship had to have a net worth of three million US dollars. He's the one who removed it. He's the one who, he, who removed the benchmark that we could only have 500 CIP citizens every year. He was the one who removed it, the leader of the opposition. He was the one who removed it in December. He was the one who, who, who removed it, not us. He's the one who allowed his friends to open an escrow account overseas. He was the one, not us, the leader of the opposition. These meetings were extremely productive. And I got valuable insights into the challenges of both illegal and legal migration, which is confronting the European Union in the lead up to the parliamentary elections in June this year. The fact is, the proposal from the EU Commission must be passed by the European Parliament. And that has not happened. Because the European Parliament, the elections in the European Parliament in June this year. The proposal states that the CIP is one of the reasons, just one of the reasons, adding to the other four, that we can lose the visa access. CIP has been added to one of the reasons. <laughs> one of the reasons adding to the fall that already exists. And that has not been voted upon by the European Parliament because the elections are going to be held in June. That was a proposal from the European Commission which has gone to the Parliament and the Parliament will vote for it for or against it after elections in June. So the idea that there is a loss of, of, of visa, visa immediately is very improbable. The EU or the British government have never called into question our due diligence processes. The British government were in St. Lucia. There are discussions with the CIP unit. There is in discussions with the Bank of St. Lucia. And I'm going to get back to the Bank of St. Lucia in a while to show you the rigorous nature of our due diligence processes. <clears throat> our CIP program continues to be one of the most robust, secure, and transparent in the world. Our due diligence processes incorporates a multi-layered methodology that includes background checks by official law enforcement and the regional enforcement organizations like the Joint Regional Communication Center, JRCC, and IMPACTS. And I'm going to prove to you in a while. Under my government, St. Lucia was added to Canada's partial visa waiver scheme under our government. Me as Prime Minister, not the leader of the opposition. We signed up with four other Eastern Caribbean states to six citizenship by investment principles proposed by the United States of America in 2023. We were the first country in the region to stop accepting citizen applications from Russians. We were the first after the start of the Ukraine war. We were the first. In fact, we rejected applications 
that had already come to St. Lucia. We rejected it. We were the first country, and the records will show that we were the first country to stop accepting Russian, Russian applications. We were the first country. The opposition leader is living in his own fantasy. He is, at, he is living in his own fantasy of misinformation and his own fantasy of trying to destabilize the economy of St. Lucia for his own private political purposes. Regarding the matter of underpricing, there's official memoranda from the Citizenship by Investment Program dated April 15, 2024. And it's the, it reads, unlawful reduction of real estate investment sum. <clears throat> and I'll, I'll read that memo for you. From the inception of St. Lucia's CIP program on 1st January 2016 until 34 December 2022, the qualifying investment sum into an approved real estate project was a minimum of $300,000 along with the applic applicable administrative fee. Okay. These are things that, you, that is very important to you. And that was changed by the leader of the opposition. He, his government reduced it. His government reduced it. In every instant, citizenship is only granted pursuant to the applicant making the full legislated minimum investment into the developer's approved escrow accounts after meeting the necessary due diligence review. In every instance, that sum must be paid by each successful applicant into the approved escrow accounts. St. Lucia cannot determine or regulate fees paid to the authorized agents. St. Lucia can't. It's an agreement between two parties that St. Lucia has. But what St. Lucia ensures that happens is that the due diligence is rigorous and the due diligence is complete. I want to tell you the due diligence processes and the due diligence, the steps that are taken with, for due diligence in St. Lucia. One, any application is sent to foreign due diligence companies that operate from out of, out of the country. One. Two, it is sent to the special branch. And three, it is sent to the JR, it is sent to impacts and up to March 22nd we have correspondence from impacts recognizing the fact that St. Lucia's CIP program goes to them for vetting and here's what it reads it reads the office of the executive director of CARICOM impacts in an effort to streamline and ensure all relevant data for, for CIP applicants are captured, forwards for necessary attention, and immediate implementation. The amended CIP security vetting sheets, along with accompanying SOP standard operation procedures, SOP for same, kindly make note of requests for passport issue and expiration dates, occupation, country of residence fields that have now been included an extra layer of due diligence in March 22nd, 2024. That's from the JRC. Every applicant, every CIP applicant goes through a vetting process that in that vetting process, local from within the the, 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 the CIP unit, special branch, JRCC, and a foreign, a 
foreign due diligence firm. St. Lucia is the only country that says that applicants must have a face-to-face -face interview through using by virtual means. The only country that these are part of the arrangements that we agreed to by the United States. But what is most important and dangerous about the leader of the opposition is that any money that comes into the CIP account has to go for a vetting process from the bank. All monies that come into the CIP account must go through a vetting process from the bank. So there's an extra layer of vetting from the bank that is called know your customer and it says the source is called the source of funds that all of you and me have to present if we are if we are depositing money in the bank from the source. So that's another layer. So solution doesn't accept CIP money outside of, of, of the country. It comes in and has to be vetted by the bank. So the leader of the, of, the, of, the, of the opposition is a master of misinformation. When he goes internationally and says to the world that St. Lucia's due diligence process is, is, is questionable, the money has to come through the bank. And it is, there is a process of vetting that takes place there in the New York customer, the New York customer situation. Right? Every applicant immediately goes through these three levels of due, of due diligence. And St. Lucia does not accept any applicant who has been rejected by another country. There is no incident in St. Lucia of any issues regarding our CIP program. There's not been one incident because of the due diligence that happens in St. Lucia with our, our, our CIP program. So that criticism is unsubstantiated. It is based on lies. It's based on misinformation and the words of a desperate man who is seeking political power. What the leader of the opposition doesn't want to happen, he does not want St. Lucia to enjoy the benefits of the CIP program like our neighbors. If you go to Dominica now, you'll find that in Dominica, literally thousands of people have benefited from the CIP program in terms of housing. Free housing. The only attempt by the leader of the opposition failed when St. Lucia taxpayers had to pay a firm over $12 million for his failed attempt to cause investment by a company called Range. And if you go to Dominica today, that company has opened a Dominica's first six-star hotel property because of the failed attempt by the leader of the opposition when there's leader of government to get this investment going. What he doesn't want to happen, he understands the benefits that the CIP program can give to the people of the country through housing, through roads, through community development. So he's trying his best to muddy the water, to cause the confidence in St. Lucia to be diminished so that investors can be afraid and not invest in this country. The matter of due diligence is completely not, and the information is available. The due diligence is not in question at all. The leader of the opposition is just basically envious of the progress that St. Lucia is making. And you will hear in our budget statement where this country is heading. You will hear the investments that happen in this country. You will hear the results of prudent financial management in, in, has happened in, in this country. You will hear where this country is going and why the leader of the opposition is trying his best to stop these efforts by misinformation. Because he cannot, with any he can't substantiate any of these accusations with any fact. I heard the leader of the opposition speaking to a foreign journalist and making the point that the reason why St. Lucia's CIP program takes so long is because we do it directly. 
The money must come through the bank. The money for the CI program must come through the bank. And the bank has their own due diligence processes. So I want to assure solutions that Seleucia's integrity, that the due diligence required to make our CIP program as robust and as rigorous as possible is well in place. I thank you. Questions? back to what you said about um, the CIP being one of four reasons. Um, can you just repeat that statement yes. again? Yes. Uh, yeah. The European Commission has made a suggestion to the European Parliament. There are two bodies. You see, what <laughs> in that misinformation world, what the leader of the opposition is doing, he's mixing the two and making them look like one. You understand? Which is very deliberate. There are two bodies. There is the European Commission and there is the European Parliament. Two bodies. The Parliament is elected. There are elections in the Parliament in June. There's going to be elections. Like we're going to have a solution in 2026. Okay? Where the people vote. But there's a commission which is like the civil service. And the commission makes recommendations to the parliament, and the parliament votes for these recommendations. So what has happened is the commission has made a recommendation that one of the reasons that visa-free access can be withdrawn is countries who have CIP programs. That's all that has happened. What are the other three reasons? The other, I think one of them is um, mass migration, Somebody is, is because the, in Europe, as you know for yourselves as journalists, there's a migration problem. You're aware of that. A serious migration problem, illegal migration problem in, into Europe. And it's, so I think the CIP program has add has been added to, to it. What the reason why? But the parliament has to vote for it. And that's that's the point. The parliament must vote for it. The parliament. So we have no idea what the parliament will vote for. And when that happens. When it happens, if the parliament votes for it, there are other processes which will will go to that similar point. In your discussions, um, were any suggestions, recommendations made by the EU Commission? No, that so was not that or? was not a meeting for recommendations. It was a meeting for information. The EU didn't call us, you know. We went to the EU. Mm -hmm. It didn't call us. We to, listen to me. Here's what we have on the table, and they said to us, "Here's what we have on the table. What we have on the table." is that the European Commission had made a recommendation. Not St. Lucia's CIP program, you know. Because the CIP program is not St. Lucia's CIP program. And this is, this is the misinformation of the leader of the opposition. It's CIP programs generally. Not St. Lucia's CIP program. CIP program. And let me tell you something further. St. Lucia has been the country that has benefited the least from the CIP because we started the, la the, the, we started the latest. And let me tell you historically how we got into the CIP program. We got into the CIP program through a commission that included members of the opposition. So they knew very, they knew very well what was happening there. It wasn't secret. In fact, one of the members of the commission is a high-ranking official of the United Workers Party. High-ranking official. He was involved in the commission that put the CIP program together. So the CIP program wasn't done in any... In any in any in any um clandestine manner. They were involved in the entire thing. And we came in late and that's why we've benefited the least. So you were just on a fact finding mission? We were okay. just no an information sharing mission. Okay. Any questions? What was, uh, sorry, Prime Minister, what was the feedback from you? Oh hi, how, how are you? I haven't seen you for ages. Thank you so much. I'm doing okay. Thank okay. you so much. Yes. So since you shared information with the EU, what was their feedback? Because you said you wanted to let them know about Senusha's, the vigorousness of our CIP program, how sturdy it is, uh, and that we're following all the rules. What was their information to you? The information feedback? to me, as I said earlier, the commission sends proposals to the parliament. 
what the was parliament, the, what was the thinking on what the, you, you said cannot to them? say you cannot I cannot tell you what the parliament is thinking. The parliament will vote. The what happened? And I'm sorry you came so late. Let's let's go for that again. Let's go for it again. Because I wanted to be to be clear. Because I want you to fact check me. Thank you. I've always said to, I've always said to journalists, fact check me and the leader of the opposition. But you all seem to fact check him. And 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 and, and that concerns me. Because you're you do you allow the leader of, of, of the opposition to ramble. You think that's a completely wrong. And you never stop him. He rambles with things ah come and which can be proven to be wrong. But you do not fact check him. Fact check me. Anything I've said this morning, I want you to fact check me. And if I've said what's not true, come back and tell me, Prime Minister, you lied. Because let's say I went to church and I saw the Bible use the word, in the Bible there's a word lie. That's, that's, a, that's a biblical word. I went to church yesterday and I saw it in, I think it was the, the, the epistle of the third Sunday after Easter. And in, the, in, the, in that there was lying. So the word lying, because I understand there are some people who say you insult the leader if you're telling me lies. That, that's a biblical word. So let's move on. There was a proposal from the European Commission. The European Commission is the civil service of the European Parliament. In that proposal, the proposal said, because of the problem of illegal migration in the EU, let us add country to CIP programs as one of the reasons that you can remove their visa-free status. That proposal has to go to the parliament and it's going to be voted for in the parliament. It's the parliament that takes these decisions. The commission makes a recommendation and the parliament takes the decisions. And there are elections in June and in June the parliament will take a decision on this aspect. So how do you know what you said was effective? The parliament will tell me when they vote. When they vote. So we just have to wait. Yes. We always have to wait. Because, you see, I, I want you to put it, I want you to understand it also. But you were lobbying the parliament. It's, no, I wasn't. Okay. It's a CIP. It's not St. Lucia's CIP. I want, you to, I want you to listen to that and understand and Thank check it out. I, I Even within that. European countries. There have been some, some level of discussion about CIP programs. So were you the only prime minister of a CIP country or on that part? Yes, of I was the only prime minister together with the CIP unit, yes. Why? Because the other countries have advantages that I don't have. The, the other countries have thousands of CIP applicants. Thousands. Thousands. Understand that. The other countries have benefited from the CIP program. In the recent Russia, the only attempt was a failed attempt by the leader of the opposition. When he had to pay back some of your taxpayers' money back to a, a developer, $12 million. The only program that is, work, that is happening now is a hotel project in Viewfort. It's only what's happening now, as we speak. Mm -hmm. right? So, Which hotel project is it? The hotel project at Canals and Viewfort. I had to go to Europe to find out, get the, from the horse's mouth, what is the situation as it relates to migration and a CIP program. That's what I went to do. Nobody summoned me. Nobody summoned me. I went to find out for myself. And I, and, and I want to say to you that we have no conflict with the OECD countries. In that MOA, we St. Lucia was deeply involved. Have we signed? We may say, ah, no, we haven't. For the same reason why, again, sorry that, that you late. We did not sign because we said we have contractual arrangements with investors that we want to clear for us. What are those contractual arrangements? Prime there, with people who have purchased or made applications to buy our CIP program. Many people. And that's what frightens the, the leader of the opposition. The confidence in St. Lucia. People who want to invest in St. Lucia. And he doesn't want it to happen. Because if it happens, he doesn't, what he obviously doesn't understand is when the country progresses, everybody moves. UWPs, Labour Party, Independent, everybody moves. But he's so, he is so stuck in old-fashioned, vindictive politics 
that he believes that when he, st he stops investment happening in the country, the Labour Party will, will lose the election and he get into government. So we're out of step with the other... We're not out of step. CIP no, we're not. What you said is give us some time before we sign. But did you indicate to them how much time we need? We've, we're speaking about it and we are in discussions on that. We have no conflict with our neighbours. No conflict. So there were price changes. You mentioned earlier in your opening uh, that price changes uh, that the CIP occurred solely under the former administration. Official price changes. Official. Official changes. Yes. So there were changes in January of 2023. These official are not official? Official price changes. And again, you see, this thing has been so muddied by the opposition that even you a bit, a little bit confused. I understand that. Because if I didn't know better, I might have got confused too. I'm not confused, sir. We had changes that came into effect January 1st of 2023. Mm -hmm. uh, and we had changes to the investment the for the real estate. Yes. So it's at 200000 instead of the 300000 yeah. uh -huh. Can you explain to us why those changes were necessary? Because we needed we need, we need to be attractive from what our, our neighbors are doing. So it was for competitiveness. Yes. So the former changes were because of what? Well, I, we, we never questioned that. What we questioned is the escrow accounts that we held outside the country. We never questioned the change. We never questioned that. So under our the real estate component, the escrow account. We do is not no support longer, escrow accounts at the country. It's no longer. And existing. this is why it takes some time because we have to come through due diligence in our local banks. That's the difference. Okay, very well. Just wanted to emphasize that. Uh, can you just explain to us the infrastructure component to the CIA? The infrastructure component is just like the, the only difference in that and the, and the thing is that the leader vision failed in one and taxpayers had to pay money. Taxpayers had to pay money for his failed attempts at getting, uh, at, at getting a hotel building in Russia. It's very simple. It's very simple. And you know, it's unfortunate that in his attempt to stymie the growth of St. Lucia, what he's putting is in doubt in the minds of investors. This is what Little Bush is doing. It's very simple. An investor, first of all, it doesn't cause, cause any debt on the people of the country. No direct awards that were given by a leader of the opposition, which I inherited $246 million worth of direct awards given without tendering to one or two firms at an interest rate of 5.5%. That's what I inherited. That cost me to have to pay $40 million to build roads in this country. And if you look at the roads, you, you might ask yourself where, you might ask yourself some questions. $246 million I inherited. This is, this is very simple. An investor is, decides that he's going to build roads a certain some roads which are vetted and verified by the Ministry of Infrastructure. In exchange, the investor is allowed to sell shares or to sell, sell shares in a company that will build the roads in exchange for the money to build the roads. Cause no debt to the country and, and these come in the form of CIP, CIP citizenships, which is what has caused all houses in Dominica to be built and there's a kid's economy to be able to give 13 months salary to civil servants. So the investor is, will be selling the passports? The, it's not selling the passports. The investor is allowed to passport citizenships, by citizenships as an investment into the company. Okay. Understood. That's what, and this is not new, you know. You know, you know it, it's, it's passing strange that this is being made an issue now. That's how Dominica was built. I'm sure you've, you've been to Dominica. I'm sure you, you, you've seen the houses. So this, this is, I, I, as I tell you, the reason why this is happening now, because the leader wants to stop. He wants to erode confidence in St. Lucia. Because he knows that if the CIP program begins to touch the people tangible, in a tangible way, that his chances of winning the election which are very bleak now, will get bleaker. And that's his problem. As I said before, it's burning a house to kill a rat. 
Um, Mr. Prime Minister, I wanted to uh, find out a little bit more about, um, you mentioned that there was a company called Range that uh, went, that was wanted to work with St. Lucia and is now working with... No, it's now built out here in Dominica. Right. Not working, built it. It's called... Uh, um, it's a six-star hotel. It's built on me. Built. It's there. I stayed there once. Yeah, I actually wanted to get a little bit more details on, on uh, what is it that we lost? $10 million. 10 to $12 million. A $10 $12 million investment? Yes. No. In that was money he had to pay back to the investors for breaking the agreement. Right, but we also lost our... our and, we lost, and we lost the investment, yes. And, and the, the investment on, of, in the hotel? In the hotel. And all the jobs that were coming with it? Uh, everything. The investment in the hotel. Uh, and this is something that... When did, they, when did this happen? When did they, they, The investor... And, and, and you see, again, that's provable. I can show you the document, the instruction from the Minister of Finance to pay the investor. And if you want, I can show it to you. You see, the problem with the is he never has any paper, you know. He never has any facts. All comes from his head. He never has any facts. He's never shown one document that puts St. Lucia's due diligence in question. Not one. Just from his head. Ramblings. How big an investment was that? It was... I just want to get the name of, 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 the, of, of, of the hotel. Um, could you ask the name of the, the hotel that's built by Mohammed in, in, in Dominica? Yeah. It's a major six-star hotel. So is it like a $100 million investment? Possibly. It's a major hotel. Questions? Yes. Um, you see, I want you to ask me the hard questions. Because you don't ask the leader of the hard questions. Okay. You don't. You allow him to, to say things that you know is not true. You, 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 you've, you've, the, 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 his record will tell you it's not true. So I want you to ask me the hard questions. Because I want you to fact check me. Mr. Prime Minister, in setting the um, record straight, would you say would it would it would it be prudent to say that the CIP unit could give an annual report? Say an the annual CIP, report Saint Lucia, what goes on. Saint Lucia, Saint Lucia gives an annual report every year in the Parliament that shows how the money is used. An audited report in the Parliament, and that is that was just that's one of the reasons that was. One of the things that were added on to the agreement with the Americans. St. Lucia has already been doing it. St. Lucia's CIP program doesn't happen in a room, you know. It's a, it's a massive organization with a board. You know, it's, 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 it's not a one-man show. It's a board. Independent is a board. The, the, the leader of the opposition makes a, a story about the National Economic Fund and cabinet changed the rules. Again, again, you know, much ado about nothing. Let me tell you what happened to the National Economic Fund. The National Economic Fund, certain investments go into the National Economic Fund. The National Economic Fund has an independent board. Previously, it said the National Economic Fund could be used for X, Y, Z. All what is government added to it is that any, the cabinet can ask the National Economic Fund to make an investment. That's all. So when he makes a big for the cabinet of the country, the cabinet of the country that gives directions on a $1.5 billion budget, the cabinet of the country. But the cabinet of the country can't give directions to use for the National Economic Fund. That's what he makes a fuss of. That's what he makes a fuss of. And pettiness. Pettiness. That's what he makes a fuss of. The fuss of we change it. That's what we change. I mean, we didn't change it secretly. When the parliament we changed it. It wasn't a secret. Because if the cabinet can control the budget, why can't the cabinet control the National Economic Fund? What's wrong with that? I make no apologies about that. The cabinet, in, you see, what the leader of the does understand is the government was elected by the people. The same way he complains about speaking in parliament. The people are the ones who decided that two of them would be in the parliament. Two of them. The people decided that, you know. Not us. So if the people decided, how can you dictate the rules of the parliament if the people decided only two of you can be there? The little person behaves like a spoiled child. 
The if he does have his way, he takes his 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 his, 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 his thing and, and he runs away. The people who inside that, how are you? Because we didn't put ourselves in parliament, you know. I didn't make myself prime minister. I was made prime minister by the majority of people in the parliament after winning six elections. Six. I was I became prime minister. So we I, and then when I was leader of the opposition, I accepted my role as leader of the opposition. Again, you must go back and do the fact checking. Do the fact checking. But the leader of the opposition doesn't understand. He doesn't understand that the people made him leader of the opposition. Not me. So the same way, so like you have the Gazette. You have the Gazette, you have documentation. So this CIP is something that is documented, is gazetted? They what? The CIP report. It's, um, it's, it's a, a document. I, 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 I can, can give you a copy. That's, that's you want a copy? Yes. I give you a copy. From inside of the audience, just on the, as you brought up the National Economic Fund, mm -hmm. you correctly spoke about the uh, changes made to... One change, one, one. Okay, the one, one change, change uh -huh. made to it. Mm -hmm. And speaking about fact checking, mm -hmm. when those changes were made by the UWP back in 2016, I believe it was. No, that's two different things. No, no, two, no, two, two, two different yes, things. I know. Mm -hmm. I, I was just drawing mm -hmm. the fact that you were able to make changes to the NEF and you asked for it to be fact checked. Mm -hmm. So I just want to go back a bit to, mm -hmm. to 2016. Mm -hmm. When those changes were made, mm -hmm. you were very emphatic. The Labour Party was very emphatic that it would reverse those changes made by the UWP. Why did you never... I don't recall that, but did you say that? I don't recall that. I never recall we making any point of reversing. I don't it was that. even reported by the international media. There was mm -hmm. a press release. Mm -hmm. There were statements mm -hmm. made by yourself. And members of the same I think you're party. wrong. I think you're wrong about myself. But, anyway, that's, but that's you the even staged that's, that's the point. walkout. That's the point I mean. You even staged a walkout on what? in Parliament. On what? On the CIP. On what? When those changes no, no, came. No, 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 no. Again, so you get why it? did you the not workout, reverse? The workout we ever did was on the, um, the, the, uh, T.O.R. King. That's what he worked out on. Okay, yes. That's part, the part and come with saying no, that the CIP. T.O.R. King, where he was given a thousand acres of land at one dollar Per acre. That's what he worked out on. A thousand acres of land. And where he proclaimed that he would have built 200 islands. And he also proclaimed that he had to have investments of billions of dollars. That's so what you've only had one walk out of the parliament? No, no, no. We had Under several walks out. Okay. I'm talking about the one I recall is the one that on, the, on that program. But you, the, you were not happy then that the changes were made to the CIP. Yes. And to the is, cost, because you mentioned it in your opening. Yeah. The three million dollars mm -hmm, and so forth. Uh-huh. Uh, why did you not seek to reverse those changes? Because of competition. Because all the other islands had were not doing it. So we were in line then with yeah, those yes, changes? Yes. So the changes brought us in line with the other islands? Yes. Thank you, sir. Yeah, I did. I just have one other question uh -huh. on, on the uh, canals, I think it is. Uh, the, mm, right? Canals, yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. You, you visited the site, you satisfied if the works. A very long there. time ago, a very long time ago. Okay, but you, in your estimates, when in your estimate statements, mm -hmm. you did make mention that the CIP will be earning less money uh, for the uh, fiscal year. Mm -hmm. because, and you did say... I'm glad you brought up. Again, yeah, misinformation. You, misinformation, that's good. Answer me. I mean, there was something of 120 Ask million the that the 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 previous you. year. And we are likely to get 97 million. And you said that you would uh, elaborate on why the the, the difference in okay. the in the revenue. I like you. Are you, you in a ask, position? You're asking good questions. So? I'm always in a position to do it, but it's just that the estimates were figures, and the policy is a policy. Well, I'll do it now. You see, I did something. I did something. Any question you can ask me, I'll answer you. Any question, you can ask me. Any, any. Thank and you I, and I give you, I give you the benefit. I'll ask you, and I want you to fact check what I say. Anything you ask me. And if I, make a mis if I make a mistake, you see, let me, I'll answer you. I'm not going away. When the Prime Minister says that he doesn't know something, he's ridiculed. I must be an expert in guns. I must be an expert in engineering. I must, I say, I, I'm not. Yesterday, I'll answer your question. Yesterday, I was watching UWTV about gangs. 
the multifaceted and the complex nature of gang warfare and gun warfare in the region that has, has begun to be studied from the 1990s. People of much higher intellect than me have been studying it. They haven't found a solution. They haven't found a solution. But there are people here. There are people in St. Lucia, in the opposition, who their previous occupation was not... I won't say that. Because if I say that, you will take the whole, the whole interview and put it on that. I'm not going to say that. I'm going to say what, is, what, the, what the guy's previous occupation was. I'm not going to say that. Have whole series on gang warfare and, 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 and I should solve it. Whole series. Whole. I have never proclaimed myself to be a psychologist, be an expert on social behavior, or be a sociologist. I went to school too long ago to see what I am. What I know is I'm a St. Lucian, the ninth prime minister of St. Lucia, whose basic philosophical principles is to put the people of St. Lucia first and to improve the lives of the people of St. Lucia. So I don't profess to be, I'm not an expert on gangs. You never hear me say that. But the, the, the opposition, and I've heard the cause of my resignation, uh, the, but the opposition believes I must solve gangs warfare. I must solve, um, I must solve everything. But I'm not getting, I'm not getting caught in, in that trap. I remain focused. I'm answering what you said now. I didn't forget what you said. I wasn't trying to divert. I, I wasn't trying to divert. You know, I'm just talking to you. Because, you know, I want to talk to you, young journalists. And I'd like you to talk to the leader of the, if he allows you. Because you know, the last thing he did, he used to do to the journalists, he said, I'm ashamed of you. And this is not, that's what he did to journalists. And you're supposed to be in jail. I never, I never did that. And I will never do it. I'll take all the questions from you. You see, the problem with the leader of the opposition is his history. That's the problem. My history is clear. But he wants, he, wants to, he wants to divert his history like he sits in, in, in the back of a pickup. Doesn't even know how to sit in the back of it. Doesn't even know how to sit in the back of a pickup. <laughs> Doesn't even know how to do it. When I went to college, I sat in the back of pickups. I know how to sit in the back of pickup. <laughs> so, so you said, and that's his problem. He's trying his best to be what he's not. That's his biggest problem. You, you understand? I mean, you think if I got the back of the pickup, I'll sit flat. <laughs> but you know, but you know that's, a, that's a problem. That's a problem with, with, with him. He's trying his best. He's trying too much. He's trying too much to be what he's not. That's a basic problem. Anyhow, let's get back to you. What's the name of the hotel? That's it. That's it. That's the hotel. That's the hotel. That was built by, by an investor called Mohammed, who is the range project in St. Lucia. That's the hotel. Yes, Lisa, tell me. Come again. Yes, so the question was. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The yeah. question had to do with <laughs> yeah, the yeah. discrepancy between the figures. Okay, uh, fine. Right, for this, yes, okay, the CIP good, revenue. Good, good. Very good question. This year, the CIP, the leader of Bishop is right, has three options direct investment. Infrastructure and a business investment. We had projected that $90 million would have come directly to the National Economic Fund. Hmm? And the National Economic Fund would, would have done what they had to do with it, either pay debt or put, put it in the continental fund. This, what happened is that the bond option which says to an investor, after COVID, and that's introduced by him, and we didn't change it, that you can buy a bond and you get paid after five years. That bond option attracted $34 million. So that was used to finance the budget. Hmm? $45 million was direct budgetary support, which we used to pay debts and to run the country. $45 million. Add it. 45 and... The remainder was sent into the economic, national economic development fund, which was used for purposes which I will outline. No secret in the policy statement. And there was $17 million, which was direct 
direct investment in the social and economic life of the country, which I'm going to outline. Total $120 million. That's how it was used. But you stated in the House mm -hmm. that the real estate option uh, factored into the revenue uh, collection. Uh, that yeah, it did better. So it did better. Better than, than we anticipated. You want, you want, to, you want me to go, go for that again? No, it's okay. I will, as you say, fact check. Please. Please. Yeah. And listen to me. And listen. I never, I have never proclaimed to be infallible, you know. I'm not proclaiming infallible. I mean, you, you all criticize me when I say I, 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 I made an error. Because what we've used to in St. Lucia is people be, be playing that they're infallible and they can make a mistake and they're superhuman and they have the most brains in the country. I'm not so. I'm a simple guy who is trying to contribute to the country. When I make a mistake, I raise my hand. I make a mistake. Easy. I, I, I don't, I don't, I'm not afraid that I made a mistake. If I, I say, I, I, I wouldn't go to lie and compound it for another lie. Once, once I, oh, I err, I taste my air. You understand? Like, give an example. The leader of, of, of the opposition mimicked me because they say I'm a stutterer. The tape shows him he did that, but he said he didn't do it. The tape. There's a tape that says the leader of the opposition was going in. When they asked the prime minister, he said, uh, uh, uh. He said he didn't do it. Now, why you all don't fact check him and tell him, but the leader of the opposition, you said it. Why aren't you? But you all don't do that. I don't tell you, I don't tell you what to do, you know. But I'm saying to you, I want you to, to treat me. I want you to fact check me. I want you to tell me I said something that was wrong. And if I made an error, I'm going to say I made an error. If you, now listen, there's a difference between disagreeing with a policy. There are policy disagreements. If you tell me the leader of the opposition says that we should not anything you want, I'll agree. That's a policy disagreement. And that's what opposition is there for, to have policy disagreement to the government. But the idea that you can just say whatever you want, whatever you want, just to prove a point, that's what I do agree with. Yes. Um, so um, given the concerns that have been expressed over the years um, about CBI programs, CIP programs, um, do you see this ours? being something sustainable is something that that's a, that's a very good question very good question and and this is why we are trying to maximize the potential now but that's a very good question because there are issues and you said what the point i want to make to you is not issues with saint lucia because what the uh, cip program does especially with the visa free access it gives you 90 days you can live with somebody else's country that's what it does. Basically, that's all it does, right? But you must understand that Americans are also buying second passports. And if you read the latest on Bloomberg, you'll see how that business is, 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 is multiplying. There's also migration, where some people come to work in, in the country because of the peace and the quiet, and they can work on the beach, and they get, which is part of the of, of the of a CIP program. CIP program doesn't only mean the physical sale of citizenships. It has a lot of variations, right? So the question is whether St. Lucia, the time is right for St. Lucia not to look to diversify its program. And the ministers in Dubai now did, did, dealing with that. Because, and there are many people who have no citizenship, people who have been displaced because of wars and, 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 and all sorts of, 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 of disasters. They have, been, they, have no, they have nothing. The question is what do you do with these people? And the Europeans are saying, that that is causing illegal migration. I want to make a point, but these people don't do not apply. It's my humble opinion. These people don't apply for CIB passports because they have no documentation. They have no documentation. They 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 they, they, they what they call stateless. There are many stateless people in in the world, and that's a problem. Problem of migration. But the CIB is very correct that we have to relook at it because whether it's sustainable is still is a question. You're very correct. And it's, that, that's a discussion we can have, but you're correct. Okay, um, some comments were made by um, to Calix George on a Can I Help You program. Calix so George is a grown man. Hold on, let me get to him. Mm -hmm. Calix George is a... Sir Calix, 
judge is a grown, very intelligent, grown gentleman whom I must admit I have a lot of respect for. I was not there when he made his comment. I was not in the country. I didn't hear the comment. I heard some people are saying, because he's my friend, he made that comment. I mean, but that's what, that's what you get what happens to you when you're prime minister. I have, I have no problem with that. I don't know what he said. I didn't hear what he said. I'm not going to comment on what he said. I don't know. I don't know. What I know about Calix George, he's the one who caused us to be paying now what we are paying now for telephone rates. That, that, these are the good things I know about him. What I know about him, he was a minister. He was involved in the agricultural diversification of St. Lucia. That's what I know about him. But when he makes a comment, which, which you know, I tell you something. All in a sudden, we've got very conscious of the word black. All in a sudden, suddenly, you know, black, oh, you boy, you are racist. All in a sudden, we've got very conscious about that. Suddenly. That was never something to... When I grew up, I grew up with, 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 with a thing called black power. Say it loud, I'm black and I'm proud. But all in a sudden now, we've just got very, oh boy, this is, you said, you are, you are a racist. But I, I, I don't know what's, what's happening now. These are black Americans, afro American. This, this is in the lexicon of, of, the, of the world. In St. Lucia, it's an offense if you use the word black. It's an offense if you say many things. It's offensive. You know, you, you, you know what I call that? Hypocrisy. But answer my question. Answer your question. But um, the comments you made, you didn't hear it, you said. I, I wasn't here. I was in Brussels. Will you ever listen to And I wasn't to the, summoned to Brussels. Will you ever listen to the comments? I did not. Will you listen to them? There's no reason why. Calix a grown man. A very grown, intelligent man. Yes, and the comments coming from a man, a distinguished gentleman. That's his like opinion. You, like you mentioned. That's his opinion. So, yes. No, so okay. I, I just said, I just, I just, I just, I'm not, you, you're not going to drive me into defending Calix. Mm -hmm. Calix can defend himself. So I'm not going there. What I'm saying to you, why are we so sensitive when these historical facts are said? Why are we so sensitive? These are historical facts. What, well, is, what historical facts? Historical facts is there was slavery. Historical fact is we came from Africa on a boat. Historical fact is that we are not asking for reparation. Historical fact, not Philip J.P. said so. Historical fact. So why do we get so excited or so nervous when someone brings that history to, to current times as to what's happening? Why do we get so afraid? But so you said you up, did... up to today, up to today, the Jews are still talking about the Holocaust. Up to today, this morning, the Jews are still talking about it. But we do not want to deal with, with, with these issues. In Rwanda, in Rwanda, there was a, a complete massacre. The people of Rwanda are still dealing with it up to today. But not in the region, in St. Lucia. In St. Lucia. Inconvenient truth of fact. We are trying our best to hide it because we want to shield one man. It, 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 it's, it's not a we don't have a philosophical problem, you know. We want to shield one man for political reasons, so we hide behind all these things instead of getting to the facts. I'm not getting involved in that. I know, but you... When I say, if I say my father was, was a policeman, I'm not supposed to say that. Say my father, my mother, I'm not supposed to say that. Say I, I come from Warlock's Road, I'm not supposed to say that. Nonsense, I don't get involved in that. I'm going to remain focused. You see all these things? These things are diversions. Take you off the track. I'm so excited about next Tuesday. That's what I want to talk about, next Tuesday. Yes, I'm so excited about the one university program for the people of, for the young people of St. Lucia. I'm so excited about the youth economy, where, where $2 million has been given to young people to, 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 to expand their businesses. I'm excited about these things. I'm excited about the housing program. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not involved in, in petty, petty things that are being blown out of proportion just to shield one man. I'm not getting involved in that. Yeah, but you're speaking about <coughs> historical facts and the things that happened and slavery and whatnot. You already said that you did not listen to what he said, so why are you talking about historical facts? Because I have been a victim of that. Of what? I've been a victim of people accusing me if I go in the parliament and I say, and I use, people accuse me of all, of all these, 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 you know, these things that just, you see all that? That's not a philosophical problem, you know. It's just a political problem. It's, it's a political solution. It's a political defense. It's a political cover-up to hide from reality and to hide from facts. Does the solution have a 
party engaged in race baiting? Never. We never call anybody Massa. Look at who called anybody Massa. Mm -hmm. Check the records and you'll see who called Bill Massa. Check it. Yeah, um, yeah just check it. Yeah. I always tell you to check. check it. Check the records. Check it. I'm not saying who. Check it. Next question. Yeah, yeah just, just yes. quickly, sir. Briefly. Um, in the context of the global parliamentary forum, you know, I know the leader of the opposition is supposed to be attending. And I wish him luck. I hope he has yes. a very good presentation. What I'm saying I'm is, very proud of him that yes. Lucia is going there. Yes. What I'm saying is, you know, I mean, this is something of a, of a high I'm standard. I'm very proud of, of him. Standard. I applaud but, him. But just to clarify it, does it, and does it um, entail just opposition members or is it parliamentary, parliamentarians generally that... that, that Honestly, I've never heard about it before. Yeah. And... None of my members have been invited. But to any St. Lucia, any St. Lucia who is going out to represent St. Lucia, I applaud it, I support it, and I encourage it. I'm a proud St. Lucia. St. Lucia, St. Lucia is my birth, St. Lucia is where my daughter was born, St. Lucia is a place where I grew up, and St. Lucia is a place that I want to, I want to see improve. So any St. Lucia, any person who's representing St. Lucia, I support them. So I'm very proud that he's got this opportunity of a lifetime. Prime Minister, there's, certain, uh, there's been such public outrage over uh, Minister Richard Frederick's program, Can I Help You? Uh, the, the minister in, in his last program uh, made public the account of a vendor, I believe it's to the CCC, uh, maybe I can be fact-checked here by my colleagues. I don't know. But and what she's owing to the CCC... I don't know the story. You don't know the story? No, I wasn't here. Okay. So you've not been briefed yet? No, I haven't. Just like Sir George. See, let me tell you what I've been doing. I mean, I'm working on my budget. I'm working on, on, on my budget. And we appreciate that, Prime Minister. I'm working but on. it has been causing some discomfort in the public. And when you took office, you did say that you were expecting your ministers to... You know, serve with, with integrity and, and make sure that they Not are... Not I did see. I still want them to do You still want them mm -hmm. to. I will never let any of them say the uh, minister, that I'll, I, I, I'll commit crime in private. Never. Okay. However, the, the, the minister has been using his show to uh, attack, quote unquote, uh, attack private citizens. Yeah. Does that not cause you some degree of concern? I'll tell you something. I'll tell you something. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. If I'm convinced that any of my ministers is doing anything that is injurious to St. Lucia by word or deed, I will call them up. I did not hear what the minister said. I hear what you say. I'm going to find out what it means. I'm going to see him in cabinet in a while. I'll ask him what, what he said. And if, if I believe that any of my ministers is doing, any, I'll say it again, injurious to the people of the country, I will pull them up. So I'm going to ask him what he said. No, but the tape is also there. I'll it there. Okay, but you see, Lisa? Let me ask you something. What I also want you to do, I want you to have the same standard of care for all of us. All of us, the same standard of care. You see, if there's that same standard of care for all of us, for all the programs, all the talk shows, or if there was that same standard of care, I would be very, very pleased. But what, I, what I'm afraid of is some people are allowed to say the most damaging things about other people, and they never... They, they, they never that that level of public outrage. You, you might appreciate that we have much more access to some people than others, so that some people are, are much more accessible, and much more able to to be attacked and to have to defend themselves, to have to defend their statements, to have to be attacked. Some people are not that available. I understand that, but what I want to say is that I want to make the point that I am ready. Lisa, we can even sit face to face. And, and, and have a sit down. Because, you see, I want you to... Ah, uh, that's on the record. Yeah. Yeah, we can do it. Yeah, we can have a sit down. I, so we can have a sit down. I mean, I, 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 
You know, see, I had nothing hiding, you know. Well, and you know that you know my record as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very you ask me to, I'll answer you to the best of my ability, but I can't, I, I can't. I won't say, but, but what, I'm not afraid to say I can't, Lisa. I'm not afraid to say I can't. I don't have the answer to all the stories. I don't answer the question. I'm not infallible. I'm a regular, simple person who's been given the opportunity to work for the country. That's all. So you don't ever watch Can I Help You? Honestly, I've not watched it for a long time. Honestly, but but you must understand, you know, you know when people talk about <laughs> talk about <laughs> when people talk about talk about the the the, 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 the can I help you can I help you host they they pretend as if it's my creation, you know. <laughs> That's what they pretend to. You, I mean, you know, and, and, and this hypocrisy is so strong. They pretend as if it's our creation, not our creation, not our creation at all. At all. Look at no. Part of, of course, of part. course. No, 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 no. <laughs> Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. The last party you run for was the United Workers Party. But he's a cardholding member now. The city no, city no, city? no. As at today, he's not. I know he said to As at today, he's not. So you are confirming he's not. As at today, He's not. Quote me correctly. As at today, he's not. As of today, he's not. But what I want to tell you is that the only party he's joined is the Indian Party, not me. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, so but he's sitting in your cabinet. Of course, of course, because of my, my, my policy of inclusiveness. The, the former prime minister is in the cabinet. You know, and I've invited Brady Felix if you want to follow. <laughs> Once you can follow the, the, the principles of, 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 of our party. You know, because we're inclusive. We want to be like everybody together. All men and women of goodwill. We have a big umbrella. Come in. But I just want you to check that it was not my creation. Okay? Thank you very much. Have a good week. <laughs>